All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Housing Justice is Equal Justice, Advocating for Accessible, Affordable, and Fair Housing. My name is Hannah House Narova, and I'm the Director of Public Programs at Equal Justice Works. We're so grateful that you're able to join us today to hear from our fantastic panelists. If you'd like to enable closed captioning on your screen, please click the closed captioning option at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions or comments for our panelists during the session, please type them into the pathable chat box. Our panelists will answer questions towards the end of the session. As a reminder, the session will run from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time. If you have to leave during part of the session, you can always rejoin by clicking on the name of the session under the event agenda section. This session will be recorded. So if you're unable to rejoin, you will be able to listen to it at a later date. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator and former Equal Justice Works, a Housing Justice Program Fellow, Palmer Heenan. Over to you, Palmer. Thanks, Anna. Um, and thanks everybody uh, for being here, uh, especially at five o'clock on a Friday. Um, we're, I know uh, my, myself and the panel are really excited to talk to you about this critically important issue. Um, before we get into that, I just want to take a second to introduce myself and then let our panelists introduce themselves as well. Uh, as Hannah mentioned, I am a former Equal Justice Works Fellow. I was a fellow until just a few months ago. Um, uh, I recently came to the Office of the Attorney General where I am starting a systemic discrimination practice uh, to enforce basically pattern and practice of discrimination powers uh, across the state of Virginia. Um, I started my legal career as a, a public defender um, after I graduated from the Georgetown University Law Center. Um, and I'll just say uh, from my perspective, um, I've done a number of different things now in my legal career. I was even a corporate lawyer for just a little bit of time. And uh, as I said, I started my legal career as a public defender. Um, and, you know, over time and from all the experiences that I've had, it, it's really sort of interesting to get a perspective of how critically important the issue of housing is to low income people and how radically having access to stable and affordable housing can change someone's life. I mentioned I started my legal career as a public defender. My job was to keep people out of jail. And I think that um, there's a sense in which people look at that and say that's sort of the, 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 the top of the, the food pyramid when it comes to public interest. And don't get me wrong, I loved being a public defender. I miss it sometimes. But as a public defender, I was preventing something bad from happening. As a housing lawyer uh, for, for two years as an Equal Justice Works fellow, and now uh, having the opportunity to combat housing discrimination at sort of a systemic statewide level on behalf of the Commonwealth of Virginia, I, I can tell you that this is the kind of job, the kind of legal job where you can change the trajectory of you know, either a single person or huge groups of people's lives. We did systemic litigation regarding eviction moratoria during the course of the pandemic um, and, and kept hundreds of people, thousands of people even housed during that time. So I'm really excited to talk about this issue. Um, I hope that between myself and our three panelists, uh, we can convince you that this is a viable career option and not just a viable one, but one where there's a, an extreme need and it's critically important. So I'm really looking forward to moderating. We have an absolutely amazing uh, panel um, of folks to talk to you. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over first to Rashida so she can introduce herself, uh, give you all a little bit of insight into how she got to where uh, she is, and then we'll take it from there. So much, Palmer. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Rashida Phillips. I currently serve in a position of managing attorney of housing policy at Community Legal Services of Philadelphia. Um, and as the name implies, we're based in Philadelphia. We provide a broad range of civil legal services across a number of issue areas. Um, and I work specifically in our housing unit, which um, although it's called housing, it, it, it handles landlord tenant issues. We also have another unit that handles home ownership um, issues as well. And so um, I did not start off as a housing attorney. Um, I have been an attorney, I graduated law school in 2008. I went to Temple Law School 
um, here in, Phil in Philadelphia as well. Um, and my career path was a little bit windy in terms of the stuff that I was working on. Um, I spent my 1L summer at a place called Juvenile Law Center um, working with youth who were um, involved in the justice system and then spent my second summer at Community Legal Services in our Family Advocacy Unit, which represents parents who are um, caught up in the child welfare system. Um, and so that was what I had expected to do um, when I graduated law school and, and uh, started at CLS as a fellow. Um, I was a fellow in a program called um, the Martin Luther King Jr. Um, fellowship, which um, is a fellowship sponsored by a organization called Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network. And so that fellowship allowed me to come back to CLS, but instead of coming back to CLS to work on the issues I had been working on before, I actually came to CL came back to CLS as a fellow working in our um, community economic development unit. And so doing that work, um, it was really actually interesting, even though I don't I no longer do that work and we no longer do that work at CLS, but it was interesting to start off my career doing that kind of work because it allowed me to really hone a community lawyering approach to how I approach my work, which I still carry um, and, and utilize in my practice as a housing attorney. And so in the uh, CED unit, I was representing low income, small businesses, nonprofits, and particularly childcare providers, helping them to get um, licensed, helping them to get through zoning, helping them to um, lease places, everything that was needed. But um, the child care providers were a particularly well-organized group of folks. And so a lot of my approaches were um, around community lawyering and supporting things that they were already doing as opposed to a more traditional way of lawyering. And so that really informed my practice going forward. Um, but unfortunately, because of the 2008 foreclosure crisis that hit um, uh, around that time, I had CLS got a bunch of funding to do mortgage foreclosure defense work. And so um, I was put into the, our, our um, home ownership unit and spent some time. So that was my first foray sort of into housing issues in, in particular. I did not very much enjoy that unit. I'm not great at math. I had to do a lot of bankruptcies and just stuff that I just did not enjoy doing. And so I sort of made my way back into the community economic development unit, but then we had a opening in our landlord unit. And so um, because I perceived that also um, just where my career was going, what I wanted to be working on, um, I was able to get into our, I, I started working on our landlord housing unit. So I've been doing that work um, for the past almost 10 years. Sorry, I'm frozen. I don't know if it's just me. Yeah, it looks like we might have a little bit of a... I think we can still hear you though, Rashida. So maybe okay. keep on going and we'll try to fix the technical issue. Okay, and I'm going to just wrap up quickly to say um, the, uh, get, I joined our landlord-tenant unit, started working um, as a subsidized housing attorney focused on subsidized housing issues, then became manager of the unit. Um, and then eventually became managing attorney of housing policy. And I can get a little bit more into that journey um, later. Rashida, thanks so much. Um, and I, just between the two of us, I think y'all can already get a sense that there are a lot of different things that you can do in housing law and we've got even more. Uh, so I'm gonna let Noah introduce himself next. Thanks, Palmer. Uh, yeah, Noah Patton, uh, housing policy analyst at the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Um, just a little bit about the coalition. It's uh, kind of unique in the federal advocacy space because it doesn't represent a specific industry or um, specific subset of, of folks with lower incomes, but just the interests of that community broadly in terms of housing preservation, housing creation, and um, you know everything in between. I personally work on the, I help coordinate, mostly coordinate, the Disaster Housing Recovery Coalition, which is a uh, group of over 850 local, state, and national groups working um, to ensure that all disaster survivors receive the assistance that they need to uh, fully recover, the specific emphasis, obviously, on lower income disaster survivors. Um, so a little bit about me, I graduated from the University of Baltimore uh, School of Law, was barred in 2018. And uh, at the, you know, during law school, uh, excuse me, hold on. This is my fiance coming home from her housing law job. So, uh, uh, and Pepper, the dog being very excited about it. But uh, just to keep going, 
you know, worked at the Homeless Persons Representation Project for a summer as a Linda Kennedy Fellow doing state level policy work specifically about source of income non discrimination laws in the state that uh, kind of kindled an interest in me in housing just because it's such an intersectional aspect and I have ADD I'm interested in quite a wide variety of, of things but they all kind of come back to housing at a certain point so you're able to kind of get experience and gain knowledge on a wide variety of fields while working at housing on housing issues. Um, so, you know, I graduated from there, begged Antonia Fascinelli at HPRP uh, to give me a part-time policy clerk job uh, and uh, was able to finagle that into this position at the National Low Income Housing Coalition doing disaster recovery work. I uh, had never experienced a disaster before, thank God. Uh, but I've been spending the last two to three years uh, digging in very deeply about it. And I think uh, it just, again, demonstrates the intersections of housing and climate change and inequities and everything in between. So I'll, I'll stop there and throw it back to you, Paul. Thanks so much, Noah. I really appreciate it. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Bridget here so she can just briefly introduce herself. Um, thanks so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Bridget Simmons from Mount She and Her. I'm a staff attorney with the National Housing Law Project. And um, so a little bit about NHLP. NHLP is a national organization based in San Francisco, California. We provide technical assistance to attorneys who represent low-income families. That includes both renters as well as homeowners. We also provide policy support at the federal, state, and local levels in regards to policies that seek to expand access to decent, affordable, um, decent, safe, and sanitary affordable housing. We also bring impact litigation, challenging systems that curb people's access or curb families and our neighbors' access to affordable and decent housing. Um, in addition to all of that, we also administer a uh, national listserv called the Housing Justice Network. And the Housing Justice Network is made up of housing advocates throughout the country, including legal aid um, attorneys, as well as other attorneys who represent low-income um, um, families or um, individuals. Um, it also includes organizers and others who are just generally concerned about affordable housing. Um, and, you know, it's through HJN that really helps to, um, to direct the work that NHLP does at the policy level. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to discuss that more coming. But in terms of about my journey into housing, my 1L year, I also went to Georgetown Law Center and I uh, was in a special section called uh, Section B, or it's actually- Curriculum B. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Curriculum B. I went to Georgetown for Curriculum B because they promoted it as this really great, innovative social way to think about the law. And I had a, or have a background in wanting to be engaged civically. Um, so my 1L professor for property just made this property so dang gone fun. And I was like, well, this is what I want to do. Like working in this substantive area is really, it seems really interesting. Um, I also, like my parents grew up in communities that were divested and moved to other areas that had higher opportunities. And I'm a benefactor of that decision to move to a different community. Um, so I've seen how housing has such a tremendous impact on our life outcomes. And um, by the nature of going to Georgetown, I was also living in DC, had have friends that are native Washingtonians and um, really understood from their experience the, the pain that comes from being essentially pushed out of a place you call home. And so I was really interested in law school thinking about gentrification and what are the um, things that contribute or what are the factors that contribute to gentrification and how from a policy standpoint, we can really invite new investment into diversity communities, but also ensuring that current residents are allowed to remain. 
Um, and so after law school, I really wanted an opportunity to deepen my understanding about housing programs and saw a listing for the David B. Bryson Fellowship. And I joined in HLE right out of law school on a one-year fellowship. After the one year, they were gracious enough to extend me an offer to become full-time staff attorney. And so I'm here with the organization. My work primarily looks like, um, in terms of substantive work, it looks like preservation of multifamily properties, specifically doing advocacy in and around conditions, so habitability issues, also doing advocacy in and around the right to organize and making sure that right is explicitly codified in the regulations that control these programs. Um, and then I'll just say my very, very first housing job uh, was at the Community Law Center in Baltimore, Maryland. And so while that organization didn't do housing work like landlord tenant law or whatnot, they were an organization that provided legal support to community organizations. And that really informed um, how I view my role as an attorney, right? Because these community groups were really focused on building collective power with their neighbors. Um, in addition to building that collective power, also wanting to uh, build their capacity, not only in skills, but also in knowledge. And so it was really an opportunity for me to think about how I want to use my skills in helping communities to really have a say in what their what home looks like. Thanks so much, Bridget. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, hopefully, y'all can see, you know, y'all listening can see, you know, there is a a vast array of of uh, positions and, and sort of legal fields that are touched on by housing, whether it's sort of extremely high level policy analysts, uh, you know, analysis, whether it's you know home ownership, foreclosures, bankruptcy. Housing touches so many areas, and it sort of goes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning, which is that. Housing is such a critically important issue. Um, we know just factually access to you know, affordable, stable housing is the single largest determinant of, for example, childhood health outcomes, even more important than whether a child actually has a regular access to a doctor. Um, so there's so many areas that are impacted by housing. Noah mentioned you know, environmental justice, uh, you know, climate change are also areas that are, are topics, uh, excuse me, areas that are affecting housing right now. So um, what I'd like to sort of ask our panelists uh, next is sort of what did life look like for you before the pandemic? And what do you think, you know, knock on wood, um, you know, things will look like after? What are the, you know, what were the important issues before? And as, as we hopefully turn a corner here, what are you thinking are going to be the most critical issues to focus on and where the greatest need will be? within, uh, you know, housing, um, you know, for, for the attorneys or prospective attorneys uh, that are all, that are listening in, where are we going to need them? So uh, I don't know if anyone wants to pipe in, but I will, I will cold call if not, you know. <laughs> I'll jump in and start. Um, yeah, so prior to the pandemic, and I'll just start by saying, like, my work hasn't changed very much, honestly. But prior to the pandemic, so at CLS, um, our housing unit provides both direct representation as well as um, policy advocacy, advocacy and systems change work at the state, local, and national level. Um, and so a, a lot of our work looks like, you know, people who um, are facing eviction, have eviction court, facing some form of um, loss of subsidy of their, their housing subsidy, um, anything that is going to potentially make a person um, with, uh, be without shelter are issues that we address um, uh, in, our, in our unit. And so our, my work was both providing that direct representation to people as well as doing policy advocacy um, around those particular issues. Um, and for us, some of the bigger things that were happening prior to the pandemic was um, really um, having our city join sort of the right to counsel movement and to start to um, implement, we, we won a right to counsel in Philadelphia in 2019. Um, so we were working on starting to implement that right to counsel, expanding our legal representation programs, um, really looking at our work um, and 
thinking about how we framed our work, um, thinking about the sort of racial justice and gender justice issues that were very evident in our work, but that we did not always have the data for, we did not always have um, a, a good way of communicating those issues. And so really starting to shift our work to put that race equity lens, that gender justice lens on it. Um, particularly in Philadelphia, where um, we have primarily been a city of homeowners. And when the mortgage foreclosure crisis hit, that really shifted the demographics in our city um, to 50% renters, 50, about 50% renters, 50% homeowners. And so it was time, you know, around that time, to, um, between 2008 and 2015, to really, again, reframe the way that people thought about tenant rights issues. Um, where it was typically talked about as an issue of poverty, as an issue of, you know, people are just behind on rent. That's why they're in eviction, in eviction court. They don't necessarily need representation. But changing that narrative to talk about the ways in which habitability issues are coming up, people withholding their rent and still being dragged to court, the discriminate, discrimination issues that are coming up, all of the sorts of issues and nuances around the work that just hadn't been communicated for a long time particularly when the value has always been everybody needs to be a homeowner, renters are just eventual homeowners, right? And when that's obviously not the case, and there's a lack of access for particular types of people and being able to access home ownership opportunities. And also that doesn't need to be the prevailing value for everyone. Some people don't ever wanna be homeowners. And even as homeowners, right? If you are low income, if you are of a person of color, you still have issues like homeownership does not resolve the issue of housing access necessarily or housing stability because we see homeowners who are not able to make repairs. Um, you know, so again, so for us, um, it was about shifting that narrative and right to counsel was a, was a way to focus that, a way for us to also be able to, um, in our housing work, collaborate with organizers, collaborate with, with impacted people and really center them um, in the conversation, in leadership roles um, to win a right to counsel. So that, that was primarily a lot of what we were working on among other issues, but that was one of the top issues um, as well as working on just cause eviction protections and other forms of um, eviction protections for tenants. And so with the pandemic, um, sure, the focus somewhat shifted, right? And there was a level of urgency um, that, that became a part of this, right? But it's still the same considerations, right? And, and for us, it was about making those connections so that um, this idea that, you know, the pandemic has created a crisis is not really the situation, right? It, it's not really that kind of linear relationship in that way. And in fact, um, some of the work that we started doing was really intensive data work to show that the conditions that existed beforehand actually contributed to um, the ways in which the pandemic impacted people in terms of housing, in terms of race, all, all, all across the board. Um, and so that these things weren't just, didn't just come out of nowhere and the pandemic wasn't the genesis of it, um, but that these things actually made the pandemic worse than, than it, than it might have been um, because of the pre-existing housing instability and housing crisis that particularly disproportionately impacted Black folks. And so um, just quickly, our three um, sort of priorities um, this year at, um, with the pandemic is we've sort of designed an interconnected set of strategies that are um, connected to work together. And so we're focusing on eviction diversion, right to counsel, and eviction records, um, so either sealing records or um, regulating how landlords utilize records and housing decisions as three interconnected set of strategies that increase housing access, prevent eviction, and also have racial equity impacts um, because the people most impacted by evictions are Black women, are their children, are Black communities in particular in, in Philadelphia and around the country. So those are the three sort of priority areas that we're working on. But again, the pandemic didn't change our work so much, right? But it, it made evident to us um, that the crisis was being deepened by the pandemic and, and where we needed to put our resources and our priorities around our particular strategies that were. Thanks so much, Rashida. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I mean, I was in eviction court all throughout the pandemic. And I think one of the things that you said that really impacted me that I felt very deeply was like, before the pandemic, my job was the same as during the pandemic, right? It was, you know, I was in court every day. And I think there was this popular misconception that, you know, evictions were on hold. And I, there were fewer of them, I suppose. But when you're dealing with 30,000 evictions a year, um, the, the, the diff, you don't feel the difference when you go down to 20,000 a year or 15,000 a year, because it's still this, this grind. And the extent to which the pa pandemic just magnified pre-existing problems it, it's it's just so incredibly true. Um, it brought it into just stark relief, maybe called attention to it, but it didn't didn't really change that much um, at a fundamental level for, for 
most people who are actually, you know, in poverty and are facing eviction. So, um, Noah, I think um, you had said to pipe in here, so please. Yeah, yeah. I, so I, I just want to, just hopping off of Rashida's comments, you know, that's something that we see after every single climate change driven disaster, including the pandemic is that pre-existing issues in housing scarcity, pre-existing issues in uh, inequitable distribution of resources, of infrastructure and all those things, you know, are magnified by, a, um, by that natural disaster. And so, you know, pre-pandemic for me, you know, it, again, it was like mostly the same, but uh, in, in kind of a different way in that, Prior to the pandemic, I, you know, we basically my job is to talk with NLHC's partners at the local level, people doing good work at the local level uh, to understand the needs. What are the asks? What are the um, uh, issues that those folks are experiencing in terms of federal programs at FEMA? I usually just tell people my job is that I yell at FEMA. Um, and uh, because, and I've yet to meet a person that asked why. Um, so, you know, I, I do that. And, and because we're, we have friends across the country and we're, we have friends that are active in disaster recovery across the country, we're very easily, we can identify those programmatic issues where federal levels of assistance, federal assistance is not reaching those um, most in need in terms of housing assistance, or, um, you know, there are barriers enacted based on bureaucracy and a variety of things. And I can probably take another two hours and explain all those things, but I won't. Um, and so that informs directly our advocacy and our asks on the Hill and what bills we push for and things like that. But at the same time, I can also, and my colleagues at NLIFC can also provide that federal um, advocacy support that you really can't do if you're you know, directly responding to a disaster. Uh, if you're trying to figure out where uh, your clients will be housed at all uh, after a disaster, as well as fighting off uh, an unjust eviction from a landlord whose multifamily housing unit was only slightly damaged and is using that as an opportunity to evict every single person in the unit. Um, so because of that, I've committed most of the FEMA individual <laughs> assistance program regulations to memory. So uh, when the pandemic hit, and number one, I wanted to do a shout out to the um, disability justice folks because they were on this pandemic stuff like in you know November of the year before the pandemic even you know got out of China. So it was um, you know that had tipped me off. So I was looking at how this would impact our partners across the country, and it honestly it was most of mostly doing the same, but for folks that had never experienced a climate change disaster before. So it was a lot of folks that had no idea like what the emergency management system looked like, like who was their point of contact for that kind of thing, like what kind of FEMA assistance could they be eligible for. Uh, so it was a lot of assisting organizations to access uh, those resources or at least yell at their state and local governments to access those resources. Um, and so I probably didn't take a day off for like the first four months of the pandemic. Uh, and then kind of from there right into additional climate change disasters. So, you know, it's been a rough couple years in disaster housing recovery land. But, um, you know, I think it's just goes to show that with you know, worsening climate disasters uh, that magnify existing inequality, it's like you need to address both of those issues. You need to address the insufficient amount of housing that is there. Uh, you need to address the insufficient amount of uh, uh, protections that tenants have across the country, as well as, um, you know, taking emergency management officials to task for leaving behind lower income residents or uh, taking to task the idea that they built an entire disaster recovery reform system around their ideal disaster survivor, which is a middle-aged man with good insurance that lives in a single family home in a nice neighborhood. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a two-pronged approach and that's why I'm happy to be working at NLIHC, which kind of under, can, can get at those multiple multi-sector uh, approaches. So, you know, I, I, 
I, the short answer is it's, it's been more of the same, um, but uh, slightly different. And uh, if anything, it underscores the importance of the work. Bridget, did you want to pipe in? Yeah, so, you know, definitely agree with my colleagues that the pandemic has just essentially laid bare. The way in which we structure our housing system is um, really, truly really just anchored in a dramatic and unchecked imbalance of power, right? And that our system, uh, our housing systems are really impacted, continue to be impacted, will continue to be impacted by um, our country's history of uh, discrimination in its housing policies and how um, we have intentionally decided that we want to uh, isolate some of our community to certain parts of our geographic area, right? So typically it's those who face systematic oppression, either based on their race or um, you know, however else they may identify, it regulates them to the most undesirable part of our, our community. And so I think the pandemic has really forced some of us to really acknowledge that that is very present still in our housing system. Um, so as my colleagues have mentioned, uh, I think in terms of skill set, still using the same skills, writing regulatory comments and letters to federal agencies, um, trying to do um, policy work in and around the response to COVID, um, the housing response to COVID. So um, the skills have largely remained the same before pandemic, after pandemic in terms of doing the work, but the topics that we're uh, using those skills for have changed. So prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of, I primarily was doing work in and around conditions. So sitting comment letters about how HUD can improve its process for assessing the health of their assisted properties, how they can integrate tenants into that process, right? So talking to various agencies about their housing programs and how they can make them better, more efficient. Um, that's still the conversation, but now it has this uh, very uh, urgent need for the agencies to respond. So for instance, in HUD housing programs, families pay rent. Uh, they're supposed to pay rent that is reflective of their ability to pay. So generally that's 30% of their adjusted income. Um, those families, if they have a dramatic decrease in income or there is an increase in potential deductions that they're eligible for, they can seek what is called an interim recertification. And so some of the advocacy has been, hey, federal agency, make interim recertifications retroactive to the day that they happen rather than making it determined uh, making the effective date of this uh, recertification the months after they do it, right? Because there are a number of reasons why you would want to do that because some families may not know of their ability to do return, um, interim recertification or to um, the office may have been closed and, you know, just red tape, right? So, like, it is doing the policy advocacy about how HUD or whatever agency can improve their programs their response to the people in which they serve um, in light of this pandemic. Um, and so to your second question about if we're predicting about what life looks like after the pandemic. Um, so this might be me with rosy, uh, rosy colored sunglasses, but my hope is like the new, the renewed interest in housing and the renewed understanding about how flawed we have our we have structured our housing system will remain at the top of people's conscious on the other side of this pandemic. That people really carry forth with them, not just a thought, but a belief in their heart that housing is a human right. And that despite anyone's social or economic status, that they're more than that, that they deserve quality housing. You know, I'm 
no, like everyone is very much worried about evictions because families, there are families who uh, probably would have never pictured themselves potentially facing an eviction or potentially facing a foreclosure are now facing that very real reality because of the pandemic. And so my hope is that in response to this um, very unfortunate wave of potential addictions and foreclosures, that we restructure those systems so that they're more fair and that those who hold the power are no longer able to go unchecked. Thanks so much, Bridget. And I, I would, I would again just sort of double down as you were saying. I mean, you know, I worked predominantly in eviction court in Richmond, and you can perfectly overlay the you know historical redlining that occurred in Richmond, essentially systematically depriving Black families of intergenerational wealth, directly over top the zip codes that have the highest eviction rate, that have the absolute worst conditions in the homes, and you know, as Noah was kind of pointing out, also have significantly years lower life expectancies and, you know, temperatures that are oftentimes 10 or 15 degrees higher than, a, you know, a place that's just a mile and a half away in the exact same city. So it is, you know, we're, we're sort of talking about the, the multi-layered intersectionality of housing and, you know, how it touches on so many different issues. And yeah, I think, you know, you're, you're seeing now the, the fruits of these policies that existed, you know, for, for you know, decades and, and really centuries, um, you know, come back and, and really have this impact now. And uh, so, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Um, anyone want to add anything on that? Can I, can I just also add and call out specifically like those who are re-entering communities, right? So oftentimes those who are re-entering or coming out of an institution, um, it's very difficult for them to access housing because of training, right? Yep. So like, um, even if someone is like several decades past their, their um, interaction with the criminal legal system, that could still, um, you know, cost them an opportunity to access decent and affordable housing. So in addition to just thinking about, um, you know, how are we discriminating against folks of particular races, but then also how are we um, essentially discouraging people or making it more difficult for those who are re-entering our communities um, and ensuring that they're set up for the best um, opportunity for success. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And I mean, one thing that I saw consistently while I was doing eviction defense work, you know, in the courts is, especially with, you know, reentry into the community or even long after, uh, you know, folks that are, that have had contact with the criminal justice system, they struggle to get access, not just to affordable housing, but, but any housing opportunity, which makes them particularly susceptible to folks out there that are either providing scams or trafficking people, um, the, the whole nine yards. And so there's, you know, there are serious ramifications that I think if you haven't either experienced it for yourself or worked with this community day in, day out that are just hard to even fathom uh, at times. And I think you also touched on something, you know, I was kind of saying earlier, like being a public defender was was amazing because I was, I was helping people, you know, avoid, you know, an unjust system and get themselves out of that. But as a housing lawyer, you know, you can actually get someone into housing and rather than just avoid that bad, actually create some good. Um, and, you know, it's hard to say which is, is better, but certainly the outcomes I think that I've gotten as a housing attorney have been, I see the reverberations of those in the long term, which I think is interesting. Um, unless, Rashida, do you, it looked like you were, no? Okay. Um, all right. Well, we, we, uh, I want to kind of talk a little bit, you know, I know we have um, mostly law students on the call. So I want to talk to you all a little bit about we've already kind of touched on the types of opportunities that are available in housing law. And it is, I think, interesting that many of us sort of arrived at housing law in a, in a kind of windy way. Um, but if you were advising your past self about how to get into housing law and, and you know, 
what, what, what would you advise your past self as far as what should you be doing in law school? What kind of opportunities should be, you be seeking after law school? Or maybe you just wanna get your feet wet and have this experience and see if it's for you. Uh, so, so if y'all don't mind um, maybe sharing a little bit of your thoughts on that, uh, whoever wants to start us off or I can start us off. I've gotten too nice. I, saw, I, I was threatening to cold call people. Now I'm volunteering my, myself. Rashida, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know, because I'm a believer in things happen for a reason, and my path was what it was for reasons that needed to happen the way it did. But if I, if I were to give my past self some advice, um, it would definitely be to have an understanding of things like movement lawyering, community lawyering a little bit earlier in my career, and to have gone into it intentionally um, utilizing those frameworks, tools, and practices. Um, when I was in law school, um, and it wasn't like super long ago, right, but back in the two early 2000s, um, these weren't conversations that we were having um, necessarily. Like it, there was barely a conversation around public interest law um, happening. And so, to, and, and like for me going into law school, I didn't even know that I had the option to be a public interest attorney. Um, I didn't talk about this in the beginning, but for me, my path was also very windy, even getting into law school. Um, I was a young parent. I had a child at the age of 14. I did not perceive of myself for a very long time of even having the option of <laughs> going to law school. And then when it happened, um, I wasn't prepared. I was, I'm a first generation um, college student period, let alone law student. Um, and that thing that people tend to tell people going before they go start law school is like, yeah, have fun, don't study, don't prepare, you'll have, you know, you're, when you, once you get in there, which I don't think is great advice for everyone, um, particularly for a first generation person of color with very little support, have a child in tow, right? Like I, I, need, I did need to prepare because I had no idea what law school was um, and what it was about and what it was gonna do to me. <laughs> um, and so having had that preparation, being able to tell myself there is a career for you, um, I, I think I would have, been less miserable my first couple of semesters of law school had I known um, and not sort of encountered in a sort of way that I don't have time to go into the public interest field. Like I happened to meet someone who was working at CLS who put me on a panel and then we had, that, that was how I found out that there was a thing called public interest law, right? So I did, I had no sense of what my options were, um, which, which, you know, it could have saved me some time and, and some misery in, that, in those first couple of months of law school. So telling myself that um, there's a public interest field, that it's an amazing field, you will never want to do anything else with your life um, except work um, in, at a nonprofit public interest organization of some sort. Um, and that um, there is a greater purpose. There is um, movement learning. There is ways to connect to communities and to um, continue that cycle um, of, of work, of giving back, of, of um, you know, the circumstances that I came out of, um, being able to um, provide services and support that directly impacts the issues that I experience, that people in my family experience in my community. Um, so those are things that I would have told myself, but I came into that knowledge eventually. And, and so I, that's why I say everything happens. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I can go as, so like, I, when I got to law school, well, I guess number one, like pre-law school advice would be like work an actual job. I, I, I'm not a big fan of like going from undergrad straight into law school because it's like, man, okay, so, you know, you got to know like what a paycheck is and like how to, you know, just general life skills like that before you represent people having trouble with that. But uh, regardless of that, I, you know, I probably thought about being a private attorney for like one minute uh, on the first day of law school before being like, what? No, <laughs> like, of course I'm doing public interest. Uh, so it was more of a search for me in terms of like, like how, or like what that would, you know, at, at what form would that take for myself? Uh, Cause I did have a little bit of a policy background having worked in the state legislature and like, um, you know, gotten beaten down on enough uh, political campaigns uh, you know, here and there. But I think what kind of sealed the deal for me in terms of housing was, you know, number one, just taking as many of those like land use seminars as humanly possible, taking the, taking the seminar talking about 
planning, talking about um, the makeup of your city. And, you know, it's like, that's the biggest resource that I would recommend uh, students to check out is just taking a walk around their city, not just the neighborhood where you live, but like all the neighborhoods around there and like taking a look at where the services are distributed, like what type of housing is there? Like, what does the streetscape look like? And kind of start to think that just remind yourself that that is by no means an accident and that that distrib distribution uh, is was purposeful, you know, continues to be purposeful, but like was purposeful for like, you know, five, you know, what the last 300 years or something like that. Uh, and so it's like, that's all by design. So it's kind of thinking about how, how to plug yourself into undoing that uh, and doing that kind of the vestiges of Jim Crowism, uh, the, the vestiges of, you know, botched slum removal or blight removal and that sort of thing. Uh, and so, you know, I think that the best way to do that is just to be out in the community and talking to folks that aren't the people in your contracts class uh, because they know a lot more about this stuff than you do. Uh, and while you might know how all the nuts and bolts, you know, come together, like, you, you know, you don't know how it is. Uh, and so getting an insight into that uh, is just so important. And I think, you know, through those kind of conversations and through that observation, uh, you know, you'll find where you want to go and, and hopefully it's housing. So I'm, I'm just going to call out a point that that stuck out to me in Noah's comments is that these systems are rigid because we've either uh, passively or expressly said so, right? And so I think that's very important to know as a young attorney is that the way in which we view the world um, doesn't have, it doesn't have to look like this forever and that you can really use your skill. I, I think most people go into law school um, hoping to use their skills to change the world. and. Um, maybe some of your experiences in law school or some of the experiences you may have coming, you know, taking the bar first position out of law school will really dissuade you into believing like it's too hard to do um, anything, right, or to, to challenge the status quo. And so I'll just circle back to what Rashida said. It's as individuals, absolutely, it will be impossible to make those changes. But if we are collective in our struggle and understand that our struggle is um, a collective uh, hurdle in which we all have to, to work towards an overcoming, um, I think it becomes a lot more um, doable. Uh, sorry for lack of a fancy word, but it becomes more, more practical to do as an attorney. And so I would say uh, when I was in law school, I said I was not going to litigate because I just am very nervous talking to people of authority. And I was like, it's just never going to work out. I'll pass out. I'll sweat. It's just not going to be a good look. Same. Um, <laughs> and because I wanted to work in housing, I was like, oh, I could do uh, be a transactional lawyer. But that didn't sound like fun or exciting. Um, but that work is very important. Um, and so in addition to taking the job with NHLP as the Brayson Fellow, I wanted to also explore what were the other options outside of litigation and being a transactional lawyer. Um, and so it ended up looking like doing policy work and providing technical assistance to attorneys who are doing the litigation. So the first thing I would suggest to anyone um, who's interested in housing law or any kind of law is like, you should try, attempt, do something in and around litigation. Uh, and that's like super royal coming for me. Um, but it, litigation is an important, like even if you wanna do policy, understanding how litigation works is really important in doing policy work, right? Because with policy work, people are always thinking about, are we gonna get sued? Is this constitutional? Can we do this, right? And so understanding um, litigation techniques, maneuvers is really helpful in crafting policies that um, are hopefully going to be stronger against any legal challenge. Um, and 
I would also say litigation. I unfortunately had this perspective that litigation always meant I'm going to be before a judge. And that's not always the case. You can help write briefs. That's super important. So important. Tremendously important. Um, and being a thought partner in drafting briefs and drafting complaints and thinking of and crafting potential lawsuits. That's really important to litigation. I would also say, in addition to litigating, creating, being able to see patterns, right? And so I guess this is my little segue to talk about HJN. HJN is so important to the work of NHLP. Um, we don't represent clients on a daily basis in um, their interactions with landlords. Bridget, can you just remind us what HJN is? Sorry yes. to interrupt you. So HJN is the Housing Justice Network. It's a listserv of advocates throughout the country. And really it's to help support attorneys. So like if attorneys have a question, they're like, where is the regulation that describes the right to organize? They can send it to the listserv and someone's gonna answer their question. Um, and it talks about like if different jurisdictions are trying to, to, to enact something like a right to counsel, people in other jurisdictions will share their experiences and their stories. So it's a really great learning tool, support um, network. Um, but the National Housing Law Project, we don't go into eviction court every day. We don't know what it's like to do eviction defense work in Selma. We just don't. But those advocates who represent clients in those jurisdictions, they are in the best position to see the patterns, right? And so we're really um, um, beholden to advocates throughout the country who say, I see this in my community. And then, you know, through HAN, someone else can, in a different, completely different state can say, oh, you know what? I see that in my community as well. And it's this opportunity to really like point to these patterns and then you're thinking about patterns and you're like, okay, we need data. And so then you're collecting data and you're reaching out to researchers and it's a really, this field is a really great opportunity to work across various sectors of industry, right? So like um, Noah mentioned earlier, environmentalists. So working with an organization like Earth Justice, talking about, um, how important it is to have standards about what it is to have clean water. And so I just would encourage folks to think about, um, even though you might be committed to not being a litigator or not doing policy work or not being a transactional lawyer, thinking about um, those skills that those various uh, specific attorney group area have and how they can potentially help you and grow as an attorney. Um, and then obviously, uh, the last thing I would say, I traditionally say that law school does a very poor job of training up housing attorneys. Um, that may be not true anymore, but any opportunity that you have to build your knowledge about housing, so whether it's land use, whether it is about structuring financial deals for affordable housing, um, you should take advantage of those opportunities because they will serve you in the long run. And then, of course, connecting with um, anyone in the career services that has a focus on public sector work because they can put you in contact with folks that they know that are doing the work, as well as forward you listings that come across their desk. Thanks so much, Bridget. And I will just echo, you know, I think getting some litigation experience or in that general sphere is a really important thing to do. Uh, especially if you're looking to go into housing work. Um, you, you know, I, being in an eviction court, you know, for a summer would certainly give you a sense of the scope of the problem. Um, and I'll just say from a purely practical perspective, uh, some of you may be familiar with the public sector loan forgiveness program, which does make it uh, a little bit easier uh, to leave law school, even with your law school loans and go into the public sector. Um, you may have seen there's some recent changes to that program, making it easier to get loans forgiven, that kind of thing. We have, in no small part, I think EJW to thank uh, for their advocacy on that issue. Um, but I think we only have a few minutes left. I see there's one question on Pathable. Um, but if y'all have any other questions, and maybe we can get to them in the next six minutes. Um, but I saw, Melody, you had asked, do any of you find a nexus between issues faced by undocumented undoc people and tenants' rights uh, and the work you do? Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that we're all going to have uh, 
uh, quite a bit of perspective on that issue. I don't know if we'll make it past this question because it's a great one. Please, oh. Noah, I saw you were on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just because I was just talking with some folks out of California about that. Um, I'm having to do specifically with like wildfires and um, the uh, un folks that uh, are undocumented are not able to receive federal government assistance for disasters, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, given the state of things as they are now. Uh, and in addition, hosting FEMA within the Department of Homeland Security also uh, complicates issues as it comes to undocumented folks because it makes them less likely to respond to aid. It's the amount of collaboration between the DHS sub agencies are, you know, can be murky at times. So it's even worse. And it's so that's a major issue talking about. Uh, even just like getting emergency alerts in Spanish, like, you know, it is just like impossible in some places, like it shouldn't be. But um, so that's a big issue. And just like getting to know the needs of that community, which may be less likely to talk to anybody with the DHS armband on, like is a whole thing. So I'll just, I'll just keep it there. Yeah, it's very, very similar issues, obviously, many language barriers, lack of access, um, language access in a lot of ways, um, but some specific issues that we see and that were exacerbated by the pandemic is that undocumented folks have a high, high rates of illegal evictions, um, are less likely to be in formal lease agreements that are recognized by, you know, courts or other bodies, less likely to access legal services um, for reasons of language barriers and, and, and other access issues. Um, and again, we see, we have heard during the pandemic, a high level of um, landlords threatening to call ICE and, and call um, you know, various people to evict people and, and get them put out of the property early. So, so those are just some of the issues that we see there. And, and um, as Noah talked about that, that level of trust, um, which rightfully right, they, they don't trust some of us. Um, to, to do to do what we need to do to protect and, and serve serve them. So some of the ways that we try to deal with that issue is to collaborate with organizations that are based in those communities, based in some of the undocumented communities and make sure that we're getting information out to them um, and make sure our translation services and things like that are on point to be able to communicate as much as possible. So um, kind of circling back to the previous question, also there's a EJW training tomorrow for those who are interested in building their substantive capacity around housing um, law. That's tomorrow. Sorry, don't remember the date, but it's definitely happening tomorrow. It's and I'm tomorrow so from noon to 1.30. And I'm not sure if the registration for that is closed, but you can also always reach out to um, reach out to Kirsten or Brooke um, and they should be able to assist you. And so turning to this question, I'm so happy that you asked that question because it's super timely because today is the deadline to submit comments to the Department of Homeland Security in regarding their public charge rule. So you may have heard about this rule during the Trump administration where um, they were essentially attempting to say that if a family who uh, receive housing benefits um, decided that they wanted to have a change in their immigration status. So for example, if they were attempting to become a citizen, that this potentially, their uh, receiving of an assistance could potentially um, prevent them to get that change in immigration status. Um, so, I mean, I don't really have more to add outside of what my colleagues have mentioned, right? So if you have a specific immigration status, you may not be able to access particular housing programs. Um, there are some instances where federal assistance is available and there is no immigration requirement, but because the local jurisdiction has discretion over how they structure their program, they insert that immigration requirement and that's to be um, malicious, I think is the word that I'll go with. Um, and so I would say in addition to public charge, there is also uh, folks should keep on their radar the mixed status rule, which um, allows families who have um, some members who are uh, have eligibility to be assisted um, 
even though they have a mixed status family. Um, so that's my short and quick answer because we're out of time. <laughs> Bridget, that was, yeah, I was going to say that was magical. You got just right in time. Hannah, I know we're out of time, but give me 30 seconds because, uh, and this is entirely unsolicited. I just want to plug for y'all. If you're interested in this kind of exploring this kind of career, you should look around with EJW. Um, it's what got me really into housing law. It's why I have the position that I do now. That's also why I have like many of the friends that I do now. In fact, they are literally coming in my back door uh, as we speak. Uh, even though my fellowship is long over, we're all still getting together. So I strongly encourage you to look towards EJW um, if you're interested in pursuing this kind of career. They've been, I think, leaders in terms of placing people in housing careers um, in areas where there's a real need for it. Uh, so just a little plug for y'all, Hannah. I know we ran over time. I apologize. Hopefully it was worth it. <laughs> thanks so much to our panelists uh, and thanks so much to EJW for hosting. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much, Palmer and Rashida, Noah and Bridget for participating in today's session. We hoped our law students that you enjoyed it. Hopefully the recording of the session will be available for all of you without all of the freezing so that you can listen to it starting tomorrow and you can access the recording by coming back to this page on Pathable. Uh, we also want to thank our conference sponsor, Idealist, for helping make this year's conference and career fair possible. If you haven't already, we encourage you to listen to our Community of Impact, a conversation with Ami Dar and David Stern, where Ami Dar, founder and executive director of Idealist, shares with us his insights on both starting and maintaining a public interest career. If you have any questions about this year's fair or how equal justice workers can help you launch your public interest career, come speak with one of our representatives from noon to 6 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. You can find us by searching for Equal Justice Works under the Organizations tab. By the way, I sat there for two hours and no one came to talk to me. So please, tomorrow's your last day. Please come talk to our Equal Justice Works representatives. And for those um, that are still interested, please email careerfair at equaljusticeworks.org if you're interested in the housing justice training that's taking place tomorrow from noon to 1.30. And with that, I think we'll end the session. Thank you so much, everyone. And we'll see you all soon.